All right, everyone, so we're going to get started. And with this next chapter, or two chapters, we're looking at all of chapter two, and then we're just looking at two sections in chapter three, 3.3 and then 3.4. Both of these texts are on Google Classroom, so you can check those out. But really what we're going to look at is um, looking more at these choices and how people make these choices and I guess on a larger scale because we're going to look at what are called economic systems and so when you look at a country like the Russian Federation or like the People's Republic of China or even Great Britain now that it's not going to be a part of the European Union these are nation states that are going to make choices and part of these choices are how are we going to set up our economy so the picture that you're looking at right now is I know it's pixelated, but it is showing the most uh, profitable business that originated in each of these states. So some that you know, should hopefully not be surprising. Things like Dr. Pepper and Hershey's and Coca-Cola, um, Apple, Nike, Starbucks, but all of these are based on choices, meaning that Americans have wants and they need to make choices, and so ultimately in a mixed economy, in a more capitalist system, uh, there's going to be more options. And so you can decide between Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola. And ultimately, the reason why these companies will make these uh, decisions is because of their own self-interest. They're looking out for profit. And ultimately, this profit is going to be made by creating appealing products for the people to purchase. But that's how a mixed economy works. That's how a more um, capitalist system works. Whereas if you talk about a communist nation or theoretically communist like North Korea, there is none of this. So that's what we're going to look at. So at the crux of this are the three key economic questions. And these you really need to know because we're going to look at these um, in terms of, of large economies, small economies, but government systems. So the first one is what goods and services should be produced. So understand that when we talk about economic concepts, we're looking at it in two categories, goods or services. Our economy in America is becoming much more service oriented where it used to be more manufacturing oriented. And so that's a decision that our economy um, has made mostly because that's the, the direction that the free market has taken it. And then when you look at how are we going to make these goods and services? So if you talk about um, something like Starbucks coffee, okay, so from a business standpoint, the goods that we're going to create is coffee. And the way we're going to make this is by getting certain coffee grounds, coffee beans from different places around the world and trying to appeal to that. And then it's looking at who's going to consume Starbucks coffee, right? It's busy people, working professionals, things like that. And so ultimately, when a business makes decisions, they're going to answer these three questions. When a government decides to provide services, they're going to answer these questions too. So look at education in America, okay? So education is required until age 16. It's compulsory. So the United States has decided, okay, we're going to provide public education. That's a service that we're going to produce. How are we going to produce this? Well, we're going to have teachers that have specific training, and then you're going to go into schools that are buildings funded by the government. And then who's going to consume these? Well, everyone is, um, citizens and non-citizens alike, because ultimately, if we create this education and the people consume this education, it contributes to what's called the collective good. It improves society, and so the government provides this service. Just a couple of examples, but let's dive in. So a couple types of economies. We're going to go over traditional, centrally planned, market economy, and then putting it a little bit together in mixed economy. So a traditional economy is just that, is they rely on habit based on their civilization, how they've always done things. And so answering the three economic questions, if you look at the Inuit tribes, ultimately they are adapting to um, their surroundings. And so what are they going to produce? Well, they need to produce some sort of shelter that's going to provide them, um, you know, safety from the elements. And then ultimately, when you talk about the different food that they're going to eat and things like that, so you can see uh, the different animals on top here. So they're going to produce food. They're going to produce sustenance. And who's going to consume it? Well, perhaps anyone who works for it, ultimately. But a traditional economy really is something like the Inuit tribes. It's a lot of what I saw in Samoa with um, with the Matais, the village elders leading things. Yes, there is a more mixed modern European economy, but ultimately the economy does rely on a lot of custom 
and things like that. And then you look at something like uh, Soviet Russia, Communist China, not so much um, anymore. There still is a lot of centrally planned components in China. There is some, some mixed components as well. But centrally planned means you take the, um, the means of production, which we talked about before in the first chapter, land, labor, capital, human capital. And in a centrally planned economy, the government, the state, decides the land, the labor, and the capital. So let's take Stalin, for example. So 1930s, 1940s, Stalin decides, you know what, we need to industrialize. We need these five-year plans. And so ultimately, Stalin says, we are going to drill, we are going to mine, we are going to manufacture goods. And it doesn't matter if you're a Russian citizen that feels ultimately you don't want to do that. Too bad. In a centrally planned government, centrally planned economy, not the political components, but the economic components, what is being made, how it's being made. So if we go back to the questions, what goods and services should be produced? Whatever Stalin says. How should these goods and services be produced? Well, however Stalin says they should be produced. And then who consumes these? Um, well, whoever Stalin says so. And so ultimately in a centrally planned economy, it's where you have one authoritarian leader deciding the choices of the actual government itself. Then you bring in a market economy. Now, there, in, in a practical sense, there really is no such thing as a true um, market economy in a vacuum. You can get pretty close to places like Singapore, even there they have their actual property um, rights and things like that. But ultimately, what you would say was with a market economy is this is where the concept of buyer beware comes in. Because when you talk about answering the three questions in a market economy, what goods and services should be produced? Well, whatever people want. Um, people have unlimited wants, and maybe you can even influence what people want. And then how should these goods and services be produced? Well, as cheaply as possible. A lot of the times why labor goes into Southeast Asia is because it's cheaper to produce the goods and services, and you increase your profit margin. And then who's going to consume these goods and services? Well, as a capitalist in a market economy, it's very important to know who's going to consume these types of things. And so that's where target demographics come in, market research and things like that. Um, the market economy is the invisible hand. It's laissez-faire economics as, as uh, studied by and, and talked about by Adam Smith. And ultimately, there would be no government interaction uh, with a market economy. Again, most economies have some sort of mixed um, type of economy and nothing is truly market um, but there have been some instances. I mentioned Singapore, some countries like Malaysia. And then even when you look at um, like Milton Freeman going down into Chile, trying to institute market, market economy, um, these are some, some good examples. And then the last one, the fourth one, kind of bringing it together is with the mixed economies. These are most economies. And so you would say a mixed economy combines part of the tradition and it's kind of a, a cross between a market economy and some centrally controlled components. And this is what we have in, in our economy. Yes, uh, you can own your own farm, but oftentimes the harvest is not what it needs to be. And so the government will step in and provide subsidies, right? That's not true market economy. That's influence of the government. And so really with a mixed economy is where you have government action, but you also have uh, corporatism, and you also have the ability of, of individuals to start their own business without the government interfering. So we do have protections. We also have um, free market economy type ideas. And, um, and that's really what we're, what we're looking at with the mixed economy. And like I mentioned before, most economies are mixed. And understand that all of these economies are not finite. They, they run on a spectrum, which we'll get into in a little bit as well. Definitely need to know these economies. They, they are a question, or they are part of a question on the guided reading. Okay, so based on the questions, what are we going to produce? How are we going to produce it? Who's going to consume it? Societies will answer these questions, and sometimes they'll answer it based on efficiency, right? They want to make the most of the actual resources. So the United States does this with oil. We have tons of oil in our country, but ultimately it's more economically feasible. It's cheaper to import oil from places like Saudi Arabia than it is to drill for our own oil. And so this could be one example. And then when you talk about freedom, 
this is, again, another thing we see in the United States is that if you want to create your own business, yes, there's some government regulations, but you can absolutely enter. Now, some enter the marketplace. Now, some states have what are called barriers to entry. Starting a business in California can be a little bit tedious. There tends to be less economic freedom in that regard. And then even when you talk about economic freedom, my uncle, for example, who lives in Pasadena, he has uh, like an attic above his garage. He would love to just put a bathroom in there, but the city of Pasadena says, no, you're not allowed to do that. So there's not necessarily this economic freedom, and so that's kind of the mixed component as well. And then when you talk about security and predictability, I mean, this is something that we are currently struggling with with COVID-19 is just looking at, you know, when we're looking at services being available, Trump is potentially cutting payroll taxes to help this. And then when you talk about um, having a safety net will protect individuals in time of economic disaster, think of California. California has a surplus. Well, it turns out that the extra collecting of tax money just to hold on to it may come in handy. And so ultimately, that's a choice by California, whereas a state like Texas may not have a surplus. Uh, so really just looking at how we can look at these questions even, even further. So let's look at this, for example. I know this is kind of a tough image to look at. When I was in Samoa, uh, there was a hurricane that hit. And so ultimately, when you talk about a response to a natural disaster, ultimately, the government is going to have to make those those choices based on these questions. Okay, so so what are we going to provide? Okay, we need assistance. We need to have people come out from the government and check how many people are injured, how many people made it and missing and things like that. And then how are we going to produce this? Well, we're going to bring in NGOs, non-government organizations like the Red Cross, but also we're going to employ volunteer citizens and ultimately response and how a government responds to something like a natural disaster um, is based on the questions. Samoa doesn't really have a safety net. The um, fixing of this home actually came a lot from charity. And so that's something to consider too, is oftentimes when people say that the government should not be providing these services, it's because they think that the private sector should be providing these charities and, and things like that. Okay. So continuing with the economic goals, um, you talk about equity. And so some countries decide that fair distribution of wealth is a high priority. This would be countries like Sweden and Norway. They are going to have a very, very high tax margin, but ultimately they're going to give this fair distribution of wealth. And so if you talk about a concept like universal basic income, this would be a fair distribution of wealth. Every tax paying citizen gets $1,000, um, but that's not necessarily a priority for all governments and not necessarily a way that these questions in economics are answered. Now, when you talk about innovation and, and growth, this is definitely more of a characteristic of a capitalist society. Uh, the phrase necessity is the mother of invention is really at the crux here because ultimately you make something because you're going to make money. And if you innovate, it's going to lead to more profit. And so there is an onus on you to have the latest, greatest technology that is the cheapest to be produced. And ultimately what we see is when you allow the marketplace to s help people make their choices, there's much greater innovation where in Soviet Russia, there wasn't allowed, um, people weren't allowed to have this sort of innovation. And so ultimately there is not a whole lot of economic growth and which also leads to a low standard of living as well. Now, other goals, I mean, this is just based on the nation. I mean, when you talk about um, environmental protection, some countries take this very seriously, some do not. And so ultimately, you talk about what else is important in a society. For some societies, education, uh, public education is important. For others, it's, it's not. And so all of what we're talking about here is based on these three questions, different governments have to decide how are we going to make our choices at the highest level and these are the factors that influence these choices. So looking at markets, um, so just kind of diving in, this is a picture of a guy I met when I was visiting in Turkey and ultimately when you talk about a market, it's just a place to buy and sell, um, sell goods and services. So in this regard, I'm a traveling tourist and I would like a souvenir and this guy is making very nice uh, souvenirs. And so I go up to him and I say, Hey, can I buy a souvenir? He says, great. It's this amount. I give him the amount and boom, got my souvenir. That's a market. 
A market is a place where we can go. A market can be in person. It can be a virtual market. Think of buying something on Amazon. So if I need something, right? So I, I want to buy it on Amazon. Basically, you can satisfy a lot of your wants and a lot of your needs by shopping on Amazon by utilizing the Amazon marketplace, aptly named. And so really it's just this arrangement. It could be something like eBay. It could be something even like uh, like Venmo, right? Where you're exchanging currency for sake of an exchange um, in a good or service. I buy you coffee, you Venmo me money. But even when you look at the marketplace, um, when you allow the innovation, there becomes a great number of specialized tasks. And this is also a product of the Industrial Revolution. And ultimately, people are going to make things that are wanted, that are needed. And so this guy, for example, he specializes in, in Turkish pottery in this certain region of Turkey. And ultimately, not everyone is, is able to do that. So he's highly specialized in the market. So when you talk about a free market economy, it's really looking at this, what you call circular flow. And so if you take the household, for example, okay, that's, that's us. So let's say that I need to buy some new shoes. Okay. So in the household, I have money. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my money we're going to follow the green arrow and I'm going to give it to Nike. And then what Nike is going to do is they're going to take the shoes that they made and they're going to ultimately give them to me, right? Now, when you talk about the monetary flow, it comes from the firm and ultimately the money goes from the household to the firm and then the money is spent on shoes and so the, the money goes this way. And then ultimately the firms, the physical flow, okay, goes the raw materials, the land labor capital goes into the firm, then they make the shoes and then they start over. And so ultimately people pay money, people get stuff. People pay money, people receive services. And that's really when you talk about a free market, notice how there is no government whatsoever in here. This is the buyer beware. If you buy something, if you buy shoes and they ended up being knockoff Nikes, well that's your fault. You didn't do enough research. It's not the government's job to step in. So we talk about, okay, well, how can we make sure that this happens? How can we make sure that people don't abuse the system? We'll understand that in Adam Smith's capitalist ideals, he talked about this concept of self-interest. Really, it's, it's really selfishness. It's you are looking out for yourself. You are looking out for what you specifically need. And so ultimately, we say in every transaction, the buyer and seller, both the buyer and the seller consider their self-interest and their own personal gain. So you could say that I will sell you shoes and if I'm the seller and I'm selling it secondhand, I mean, I will only accept um, over a hundred dollars. That's in my self interest. Whereas you as the buyer, you don't want to spend that much money. So you're only going to buy something that's less than a hundred dollars. So what does that mean? No transaction, right? We don't get to um, exchange good or service because neither of our self interests match up. So you talk about competition. Competition ultimately is there is a scarce amount of money that people have. There's a finite amount of money. And so ultimately you would say that producers, people, governments, um, businesses that create goods and services, they are competing for everyone's same dollars. There are a million places you can go to get a haircut, get your nails done, get an oil change. And so ultimately the competition in the marketplace is where are you going to get your oil change? Where are you going to get your nails done? And so this is in the force of the free market is you have to make it very appealing. And so you have to make your business so that other people want to go there versus somewhere else. And then the most important thing here, and this is definitely a question you need to understand in the guided reading, is the invisible hand. Laissez-faire economics is that if you just let the market do its own thing, almost like, like a free range type of animal, it, it will be as successful as it can be. However, if you jump in with government planning, it's going to mess it up. It's not going to be effective. And so the invisible hand ultimately is what, this is what regulates the market. So to say it a different way, the lack of government regulation ensures that the free market will be regulated. Because if I'm being selfish and only looking out for me and you're being selfish and only looking out for you, well then only the best, most efficient interactions, exchanges, transactions will happen. 
So some advantages. I mean, this is kind of an overwhelming picture, but you look at the number of choices. The um, When you talk about economic efficiency, growth, and freedom, I mean, these these are things that you see. So it's, it's efficient because um, businesses are only going to produce what people are going to buy. And when you talk about the growth, ultimately, if, if people are willing to buy something, think about Zoom right now. The company Zoom is experiencing exponential growth because of how many people are now using Zoom because of everything else that's going on. And then as far as the economic freedom, you know, you have the choice to buy the things that you want. And ultimately, you can have certain preferences. And that's kind of the benefit. If you go to Soviet Russia, you get this um, pants suit and you get this um, bottle of water and there's no choice it's just there's one option and so these are some some added benefits and then yeah so it's it's really the variety of the goods and services it's think of something like Los Angeles the diversity of Los Angeles you could find I'm sure any ethnicity of food cuisine that you would like to find and that variety in the marketplace means that more and more restaurants will exist because it provides people with the things that they want. We only have a certain amount of money to eat out and we have to choose where we're going to eat out. So if we want to go get Ethiopian food, um, it would be on um, you know, the onus of the business to actually provide Ethiopian food for a demand for that, that cuisine, which if you haven't had it is excellent. Okay, so that's markets. That's looking at the free market specifically. Now, ultimately, when you look at a centrally planned economy, the government decides land labor capital. The government is in control of the means of production. They're going to choose what's going to be produced, how much is going to be produced, and how much they're going to charge. Now, two different terms that we need to kind of um, look at. Um, understand that socialism in 2020 has basically become a meaningless word because of how many different ways we've used it. Now, what we are going to focus on is more from the economic standpoint of democratic socialism, which is more of a philosophy. It's the idea that um, you're going to use democracy, you're going to pass laws that will help rectify wage gap, that will help rectify issues um, with socioeconomic level, and it's really using the government. And so you would say, for example, that there is many instances of socialism in the United States with this definition because we have things like education, we have government health care. But ultimately, if you want your own health care, great, have your own health care. If you don't want to go to the public schools, great, you can go to a private school or you can homeschool. And so socialism, understand, is... It, yes, there is a lot of big government trying to redistribute the wealth to help society, but there's still private ownership. So to say it a different way, socialism is where the government controls some of the means of production and meaning that they're going to take over means of production to help for the greater good of society. Um, but ultimately, you can own your own business. You can also answer the three economic questions. Whereas communism, again, uh, many different definitions, but our definition that we're going to use is with a centrally planned economy where everything is decided by the government. So socialism, some uh, private ownership. Communism, zero private ownership. The government controls everything. And so socialism at its purest sense, we don't necessarily see. Um, you could say that there's instances of socialism in the United States. And so to say that a different way, you would say that the United States has some centrally planned economic components. We have socialistic ideas, but also we are very market oriented and that would make us a mixed economy, which we'll get into in just a moment. Need to be able to differentiate between socialism and communism here. And just to give um, a more specific example, I know I've mentioned it uh, a little bit here, but Part of the former Soviet Union, what they decided to do is the government decided we are going to control all of the farms. And ultimately, we are going to lend out the farms to the actual peasants in what's called collectives. And ultimately, the government would say this, this is owned by the state, but we're going to allow you to work the land. And ultimately, it's supposed to be that everyone kind of buys in. But understand that because there's no incentive to produce more because you're not getting the profit, you're not getting to keep the food, 
People don't necessarily work hard. And so while the government's attempt to control everything is to make things more efficient, in this regard, it actually backfires. The other thing that we see is the Soviet Union, because agriculturally they were 90% peasantry, and the agriculture itself played a uh, specific role because they had to choose to, to address that. But also understand that the Soviet Union under Lenin and under Stalin really wanted to industrialize. So when you talk about land, labor, and capital, the government decided, you know what? What are we going to make? We're going to make industrialized goods. We're going to provide industrialized services. We're going to improve our military because that's the priority of, of the government. It doesn't matter if the Russian people don't want that because it's centrally planned. It's not for the government or it's not for the people to decide. And so when you look at, okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to have collectives. We're going to industrialize. And then who's going to consume this? Well, ultimately, the people are going to consume it. But uh, what this produces is poor goods because the government is producing them. There's no innovation. And there's, there's poor distribution of goods, which can lead to famines and things like that. So ultimately, when you look at something like a centrally planned economy, there's the theory of it. And that's what we've kind of looked at here is the theory of centrally planned. But what does a more practical approach of a centrally planned look like? It looks like the former Soviet Union, which isn't very economically efficient. The other thing that we see, centrally planned, CPE, uh, you have a lot of uh, poor quality goods, shortages, diminishing production. And so this is an example of a bread line. So the idea is that there is definitely enough food to go around in Russia to feed everyone. But because of the failure of the actual centrally planned economy to distribute the goods, the distribution becomes a problem and famines occur not because of, um, of people not necessarily having enough food, but because the government is not distributing the food properly. So we've talked about market, we've talked about centrally planned. So let's kind of put these together. And so in an, a mixed economy, yeah, you have laissez-faire, you can own property, um, you can create a contract with someone enter into a private agreement without the government. However, the government can also purchase your property. So we have what's called eminent domain in this country. So yeah, you can own your property, um, but the government can also provide just compensation for that. And they can also tell people that you can or cannot produce that. So for example, when you talk about like foam and surfboards, um, it's it's very bad for the economy and so and it's very dangerous to inhale the type of chemicals from that and so ultimately the government puts a cap on the amount of foam that can be made for surfboards so it doesn't matter if every American wants a surfboard the government says yeah we can only make X number of surfboards and so this is what we see in the United States and, and some people argue that the difficulty of the United States is that the Republicans want laissez-faire the Democrats want centrally planned, and when you put them together, it kind of creates a mess where you have this tug and pull of how the economy should actually um, function. And I mentioned this before, but I think this is really important, and I, I really like looking at this, and I'm, I'm curious what you guys think because and this is how old your textbook is. This is from 1999. I think things have changed. I think things have moved. But understand that when you talk about a mixed economy, I think this is at the crux of it, is that in a mixed economy, you can own your own business. Yeah, you have to get a business license. Yeah, you have to get it notarized by the government. But ultimately, you can open up your own business. And that idea here is what we call free enterprise that you can create a business, you can create an Etsy marketplace, you can create an Amazon marketplace, an eBay account, and sell these things on your own, and ultimately the government is not going to uh, get involved. So looking at this on a continuum, on the actual spectrum, Singapore, Hong Kong, definitely more free market. When you have Republicans in power, the United States merges to the right, more free market when it's uh, uh, Democrats, it goes more to the left. And I would say that North Korea is probably still there. Iran is here. I would say Cuba is moving more free market um, since it was opened up. I would say China also is going more free market as well. Russia is probably about the same. But understand that these are moving entities. And ultimately, these change because government decisions are made every day. And so when you look at comparing and contrasting governments and their response to COVID-19, I mean, this is something that you can look at is why did this country respond the way it did? Well, part of it is the function of their economy and how it's structured. 
So almost done. And we're looking at ultimately in a mixed economy and also in a market economy, the role of the consumer. Consumers communicate and they offer information to people. And so ultimately, how is Supreme able to charge ridiculous amounts for plain white tees and even ridiculous things like bricks? Well, people are willing to pay for it. And so if people communicate to Supreme, hey, I'm willing to pay outrageous things so or outrageous amounts so I can look cool in front of my friends, they're going to say, okay, well, we're going to charge that amount. And so if you don't want Supreme because you think it's too expensive, great. You don't have to purchase it. If you want to look cool in front of your friends with your super cheap plain white tee you paid $100 for, you can do that as well. And the consumer in a mixed economy has the freedom to make their own choices. And that's the most important part of this. Now you talk about the government. Okay, so the government's role is to try and protect um, people from different harms. And so when you talk about um, purchasing guns, purchasing liquor, even cigarettes, the government is going to step in and say, hey, cigarettes are going to kill you. You maybe shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't purchase that. And so we have what are called public disclosure laws. When you buy um, a car, it'll tell you, okay, it gets 30, 40 miles to the gallon. When you talk about um, medications on commercials, part of why they read off may cause death, may cause diarrhea is because it's the law. They have to do that. And so ultimately, we talk about why does the government do this? Well, it's in our best interest. I know I've made this example many times, but you go to that restaurant that has a B or C health rating. That's a public disclosure law. That's in your best interest, but ultimately, some people who are true market capitalists think that that's up to you to decide. Um, you should use other factors to to jump in, um, but that's that's kind of the crux of it. So when you talk about a mixed economy, there's the consumer's role, which is they're given the purpose or the purpose of free enterprise, allowing people to make their own businesses, is give people more choices, more freedoms, and then the government will also step in to kind of help as well. So when you talk about which economy do you like best, which you think is best to live in, I mean, obviously, extremely subjective. Um, but ultimately, we've looked at efficiency. And based on efficiency, mixed economy is the most common. We don't really see true market economies. Um, it's a varying degree of how mixed it is based on centrally planned or free market. Um, but we do see a lot of mix for, for better or for worse. Okay. A couple more ideas is when you talk about, okay, so what happens when a government decides to provide something like police officers? Well, what it does is it contributes to a public good. And so basically we pay in and we provide police officers and in return we are, you know, we are able to um, have greater safety, less crime and things like that. And so what you would say is that police officers are funded by the government funded by our tax dollars because it's for keeping the peace. Even paying for teachers, okay? Teachers are paid, their salaries are paid by the government. And the reason why is because it, it's believed that education it contributes to the public good, makes the economy more efficient. And ultimately, we do have some issues where you have what's called the free rider problem. And we actually talked about this in our study of government with interest groups. But the free rider is where someone benefits from something like clean air, right? So you have like the clean air and water acts that get passed, but they, you know, didn't pay taxes or they disagreed with it. Well, they still benefit from cleaner air, cleaner water, even though they didn't contribute to it. Okay. So it says, would the free market ensure that roads are built everywhere they are needed? Probably not. Um, people talk about how we could have toll roads or we could have people chip in. I don't know about you, but I am not really willing to spend my hard-earned money and pool a bunch of money with my neighbors to keep up the roads in my neighborhood. And so a market failure is where the free market doesn't give us everything we need. It satisfies a lot of different wants. But just because you can get all your music on your phone doesn't mean that there's other things that we don't need. So the market allows for you to have choices in how you stream your music, but then we don't have roads or then we don't have hospitals and things like that. And so a market failure ultimately is a situation where the market on its own, without any, um, any type of interference by the government, it does not distribute the resources efficiently. And so the roads is a good example. If you just say, let's leave everything up to the market without any sort of government intervention, well, the road probably wouldn't get built. 
many people who are critics of the capitalist system of market economies point to market failures. If you just allow the businesses, the producers, and the consumers to do what they want, then not everything would get covered. There wouldn't be things like healthcare. There wouldn't be things like public roads and hospitals. So that's that's one of the critiques. And that's why a lot of Democrats say if you allow the free market to happen, there will be too much market failure. And so the government is just stepping in to prevent market failure. Okay, an externality. Think of an externality as a side effect. Um, a side effect just meaning what we're going to do is we're going to create this factory and we're going to produce, uh, let's say it's sriracha. It's a sriracha factory. And in the sriracha factory, we're going to make sriracha, but it's very bad for the environment. So you'd say we choose to make sriracha, but it pollutes. It brings um, the chili pepper into the air, can cause headaches and things like that or for people in Hawthorne. And so an externality is this side effect is we choose to make something. What are the positives of this? What are the negatives of this? positive being benefits, costs being negative. And so if we look at this example as the building of a new dam and the creation of a lake generates positive and negative externalities. So positive externality, a benefit of creating this dam is the hydroelectric power. Um, and then you can talk about uh, negative externalities where it's destroying the environment, um, benefit, positive externalities, it brings tourism, negative externality, kills the ecosystems. And so you look at any decision that's made, any choice made by a government, made by a producer, made by a firm, made by an individual, there are positives and negatives that come from that. And so oftentimes economists look at making decisions and then looking at cost benefit, what are the externalities that this produces? So when you talk about the need for government intervention, oftentimes the main way that governments intervene with centrally planned um, instances is with the poverty problem. People live what's called below the poverty threshold, also known as the poverty line. I believe it's around 25000 for household today. And so ultimately what you would say in a more centrally planned economy with instances of socialism is in order to help the poverty threshold, ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to provide what's called welfare. You're going to provide programs. So when you ask the questions, what is the government going to do? They're going to provide welfare. How are we going to provide welfare? Well, we're going to have Americans pay tax dollars. And who's going to consume this? Well, the people who really need it, the poor. And so many people disagree with this type of safety net. But ultimately what you would say is people are poor and oftentimes um, are said to be a product of market failure. The reason you have homelessness in one regard, although this is just one instance, one factor, is because there's a market failure because you know there are negative externalities of certain choices that people made because of more profit made here some people suffer and so welfare is a socialist ideal right you're using democratic means you're using laws to redistribute the wealth so let's look at some examples so there's cash transfer and this is this is what we see so for example um tanf which is something that you'll see on your questions as well is is TAMF really allows the state to decide how they want to provide their funds. This was under the Clinton administration in the 90s. And this is an example of something that's much more conservative, but was passed by a Democratic president, which is interesting, perhaps because Clinton is more of a, he's a Southern Democrat, a little bit more moderate. But this is state discretion. So it's saying from an economic standpoint, the federal government is allowing the states to decide and make some choices on their own. So it's saying, okay, states, you get to decide in a way how you want to answer the three key economic questions. We also see this with Social Security. We see this with people over 65. If they are retired, they receive Social Security. And this is ultimately a way to help people retire and help people after retirement. But it's also for the disabled. And these are examples of cash transfers because that's what the government decided. For um, disability payment, it could just be medical fees, medical payments. But in this regard, for the disabled, it's cash benefit. And then the last one that we see is with workers' compensation. So the government's going to step in and say, you're a private business, but if you want to continue being a private business in this country, you need to make sure that you offer workmen's compensation, which means that the state is going to pay in a little bit, the, gov or the, the company is going to pay in a little bit, and if you get hurt on the job, you will be covered. And that's ultimately 
with the market failure is that these three ideas are not necessarily something that the market would provide on its own. So oftentimes governments will step in to make sure that these things are these things are covered. Okay, so that's the end of the slideshow. I want to just go back really quick to the questions. So we, we go over that. And this, guys, ultimately, just go ahead and look over the questions. All of the information should be in here. And so if we're looking at this from the very beginning, what are these three economic questions? Well, what goods and services should be produced? In a mixed economy, it's a balance between the government deciding and the producers, the private sector deciding. In a market economy, ultimately, it's the producers, not the government, that decides what's going to get made and how it's going to get made. Um, in a market economy, basically anyone who has the cash to make an exchange, a transaction, are the ones who decide, whereas in Stalinist Russia, ultimately, it's the government who decides all three of these questions. And so I really implore you to kind of look at how do these ideas relate to governments today and how they make current choices. Very good, guys. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Just send me an email and we'll go from there.